Maris Monastery in Haifa. It is from the chief rabbi of Israel, David Lau, president of the Chief Rabbinic Council and chief rabbi of Israel. This is what he wrote. I am aware that in the past few weeks, a conflict has unfolded in the domain of the Stella Maris Monastery. Although I'm not familiar with the specific details, I find it appropriate to express my opinion about the principles of this conduct. I harshly condemn causing harm to members of the clergy in particular and to any person in general due to their faith. Throughout history, the Jewish religion has been injured more than any other because of its faith, and this requires us even more to insist that any action that is violent by nature is forbidden. We are all obliged to protect the dignity of the other, and it is strongly forbidden to damage the property of another. Hence, it is unthinkable to harm religious leaders or the clergy of other faiths. All human beings are required to respect one another and to behave appropriately towards all people. We have a rule in Judaism, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. I assume you have turned to the authorities entrusted with upholding the law so that those who have committed these wrongdoings will be punished. Let's pray to the heavens that we will live in a world of peace, a world in which the words of the prophet Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning books, hooks will be realized. And for days of peace and tranquility for all inhabitants of the universe, again, chief rabbi of Israel, David Lau. So it's important to know how others are viewing these acts of vandalism and these attacks on clergy and other Christians. Now, my hope is that this also translates out to attitudes towards Messianic Jews, because often Christians, Gentile Christians, Catholics, Protestants, etc., they are put in one category, but Jews who believe in Jesus and maintain a Jewish identity are put in another category. I pray that this same sentiment will be expressed towards Messianic Jews as well. Okay, one more statement, and this was for, um, for immediate release as of today, Thursday, September, excuse me, uh, okay, it says Thursday, September 12th, 2023, but it's either Tuesday, September 12th, or it is Thursday, September 14th, so something wrong on the date here. All right. This is also highly relevant because Christian Zionist organizations like International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, for years, some of their leaders have been denied visas, renewing, renewing clergy visas. And remember, the ICEJ has a non-proselytizing rule that if you work with them, you're just involved in humanitarian work and standing with Israel, and it's on record you're not doing this in order to proselytize. Now, do the leaders of Christian Embassy in Jerusalem want to see Jewish people come to faith in Jesus? Yes, they're Christians. They do. But they have a non-proselytizing policy. So it would be different than, say, how Israel might look at me as I'm a missionary and you know, I'm a missionary to the Jewish people, etc., or have negative views like that, although I should still have complete liberty to come and go in the land, etc. But to, to, to say like Christian Zionists, huh? They can't get their clergy visas renewed. So this is a statement. Mr. Eyal Sisu, the new director general of the Population Administration within the Ministry of Interior, Interior convened a meeting this week with senior leaders of three leading global Christian Zionist organizations based in Israel, along with their legal counsel, to discuss their recent staff visa issues. Mr. Sisu assured the representatives from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem, Bridges for Peace, and Christian Friends of Israel, I think all of them have a non-proselytizing policy, that there is no change in the policy of the State of Israel regarding the Christian Zionist organizations, adding that their presence in the country is warmly welcomed and their support for Israel is appreciated. It was agreed that the prior understanding from 2020 concerning visas available to the, tree, the three Christian organizations would be upheld by the Ministry of Interior until any new regulations are approved that will meet the long-term staffing needs of the organizations. The Christian organizations express their gratitude to Mr. Sisu for the clarification and the very positive attitude towards their work on Israel's behalf. And headline on allisrael.com announces Israeli Interior Ministry apologizes to Christian Zionist groups. So that's, that's positive, and it is keeping with the spirit of Israel. It is keeping with some of the, the history of Israel in terms of relationships to Christians. So just want to report that. We report the negative when it happens. We want to report the positive as well. With that, let's go to the phones. We'll start in, in South Africa. Doug, welcome to the line of fire. 
Hi, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good, good. Um, Dr. Brown, my question is, um, I found out I was Jewish about six years ago. Um, I became a Christian in high school. Found out I was Jewish through my mom's mom's mom, who um, Jewish family. And I've been struggling with um, the question, the Mosaic and the Abrahamic covenants, covenants that our ancestors cut with the Lord, um, are they still relevant to us today? Um, the reason I ask that is it, it says quite a few times that these are, or um, that there's wording about from generation to generation, yes. through, um, that type of stuff. So there's... Are these still valid today, and are we as, as covenantal Jews required to uphold those things that the Lord asks? Right. So the first thing is that the Abrahamic covenant was, was separate from the Sinai covenant, from the Mosaic covenant. So we separate yes. that, and that yes. was simply the circumcision of sons on the eighth day. And, and we should still carry that out. It's, it's part of our heritage. It's not. Paul makes clear in, in 1 Corinthians 7 and in Galatians 6 that circumcision in itself is nothing in terms of salvation, forgiveness of sins, etc. Yes. Uh, however, uh, it is it is simply a, a covenantal solidarity through history, and if we're able to practice that, it's it's a good thing. the The Mosaic Covenant was established so more about as obedience. Or, yeah, the Mosaic Covenant was established as as a forever covenant, but we failed. We failed repeatedly because of which God made a new and better covenant, which was different than the Mosaic Covenant, as as expressed in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. So we are under a new and better covenant, and that's reflected in the commands and directives that we have in the New Testament books, and those things that are reiterated outside of the Torah in the rest of the Hebrew Bible. So are you obligated as a Jewish believer to keep Seventh-day Sabbath? No. Are you obligated to keep dietary laws? No. That was part of the Sinai Covenant. However, all of this has meaning and relevance. We learn from it, and then the Holy Spirit writes things on our hearts. So there is some level of, if you were raised in a home, and let 1 Corinthians 7, beginning in verse 17, be your guide. If, if you were raised in a home, and you were Sabbath observant, and this is a way of life for you, and you, you observe the dietary laws, now you come to know Jesus Yeshua, should you stop those? Well, why, why would you stop them? It's not like they're evil or wrong, right? There's much beauty and, 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 and grace in them, especially Sabbath. But now it, it comes with a new meaning and a new understanding, beginning with finding rest in Yeshua. What I encourage you to do is go to my website, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, and just search for Law, Law of Moses, Sinai Covenant to get more insight and how we understand Yeshua's teachings about he didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. All these things find their full meaning in him, and then we live them out. Hey, thank you for the call, and God bless. Chronic inflammation is the greatest health threat to humanity. Infections, injuries, toxins, poor diet, and chronic stress can attack your immune system and lead to chronic inflammation. But now there's a solution you can fight this dangerous silent killer with. Nopalea, made from the superfruit of the Nepal cactus, containing a unique group of bioflavonoids clinically shown to reduce chronic inflammation. In a random double-blind placebo-controlled study, it showed a reduction of elevated at-risk C-reactive protein levels, resulting in an improvement in range of motion in the back, neck, and joints and an overall improvement in the quality of life. Nopalea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. Let's hear what customers are saying. I'm a personal trainer and owner of three gyms. Super excited, doing a renovation in here, bringing new equipment in. And as I was bringing the new equipment in, I was trying to move a piece. I moved, the equipment didn't move, and I injured myself severely. So it was frustrating, it was, it was really depressing. I wasn't able to work out, I wasn't able to train, I wasn't able to do just normal daily functions. After taking Nopalea, I found that it really helped with my recovery, not only with my severe injury in my back, but it also helped in my recovery of my workouts. Nopalea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. To place your order, call 800-771-5584 or online at trivita.com. 
As a new customer introductory offer, use promo code BROWN25 for a 25% discount on your purchase of No Pelea. And 100% of your first order will go to the support of Line of Fire. Go to Trivita.com or call 800-771-5584. Again, 800-771-5584. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. His grace and his face shine Welcome, friends, to the Line of Fire. It is thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you. Bottom of the hour. Bottom of the hour, I'll be joined with Israel Bitton talking about this amazing new book he's put out on anti-Semitism and talking about the phenomenon of anti-Semitism. To everyone else, the Shana Tova, the Hebrew greeting, may you be written down for a new year, for a good year. Again, as uh, over the centuries, the Feast of Trumpets morphed into the Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, and so Jews around the world celebrate this special time, not with partying, but with sobriety, with introspection, and a consciousness of that we all stand before God. Uh, talking to some of the students in my uh, spiritual leadership class here at, at uh, the spiritual leadership school at Mercy Culture, uh, about working out and about uh, about Trivita, our co-sponsor. So just want to mention this to everybody listening. If you're struggling with arthritis or other inflammation conditions that you're aware of, and you want to find out more about no Pelea, so rather than being on drugs and things like this, something that you might find really helpful, if you'd like to find out more, call 800-771-5584. If you're calling in the night or in the on the weekend, you'll get a call back. 800-771-5584. If you'd like to look into this online, it's trivita.com, trivita.com, and you want to use the code BROWN25 to get you a 25% discount and for 100% of your first order to be donated to the Line of Fire. Everyone enjoying the products, wonderful, and your ongoing orders, more than a tithe goes to support us getting on new stations. So thank you for standing with us. All right. Let us go over to Cincinnati, Ohio. Mark, welcome to the Line of Fire. Hey, thanks, Dr. Brown. I wanted to uh, throw a quick question at you. This uh, I've had something that's been really perplexing to me in the faith. I've recently returned to the faith. I have really bad OCD, and sometimes when my mind will hit on something, it's like i got to find the answer, and I can't find the answer. That, uh, somebody had called in to you before about it, Ezekiel's Temple. Uh -huh. You would mentioned Averbeck, Hebrews 9 and 10, that it's for outward cleansing and point back to Christ. So I was reading all that, and there were just a few observations that I was going to throw at you. I know you have a good memory, so I was just going to mention a couple. So at one point in Hebrews 10, it says, where there is forgiveness, no more sacrifices needed. So I wondered about that. It says the ceremonial system existed in the Old Testament in Hebrews 9, but it doesn't mention the end times. I'm wondering where is Christ in this whole thing? Why doesn't it mention Christ? And then I'm wondering why it mentions that the uncircumcised in flesh can't go into the temple. Like that'd be part of the church because a lot of the church is an uncircumcised in flesh or is uncircumcised in flesh. So right, Yo, that's my, I know that's a lot of things. But. No, no, no. Great questions. So, so number one, the larger question of Ezekiel's temple is somewhat mystifying to everyone regardless of whether you're a traditional Jew, a Christian who only believes in a future spiritual kingdom, a Christian who believes in a millennial earthly kingdom, it's a puzzle for everybody. It, it challenges everybody. Sure. If you're a traditional Jew, the problem is the dimensions are not the dimensions of the Mosaic temple, and they're actually variations in some of the, the, the customs, so the Mosaic temple slash tabernacle. Yeah. So that's a problem for traditional Judaism. If you are one who believes sure. in a millennial kingdom, it's a problem because why are there sacrifices at all, right? As you say. Yeah. And if you yeah. just believe it's a spiritual future kingdom or something, then why such a detailed description? So it's, it's, quite, it's a question for everybody. Uh, Dr. Averbeck would say regarding Hebrews 10 that the, the sacrifices, for example, Day of Atonement, or this is how I would answer. I don't want to say he would answer like this. 
Day of Atonement, which was specifically about, about atonement and reconciliation. Well, you're not going to need that anymore. It doesn't mean you're not going to need ritual washing or things like that or sacrifices that just had to do with ritual cleansing. Well, maybe not because those serve a different function. But the whole thing okay. was, right, so you have the once and for all forgiveness at the cross. And Hebrews is even saying that's the only place it ever came from. As to why the mm -hmm. Messiah is not mentioned, uh, it, it could be similar to Isaiah 2, which is that it's all the nations streaming to Jerusalem to worship the God of Israel. Everyone recognizes that's a messianic prophecy. Traditional Jews, traditional mm -hmm. Christians recognize that as a messianic prophecy, but it doesn't mention Messiah. So, okay. so it, he doesn't always have to be mentioned. On the flip side, though, it's certainly possible that it is just meant as a future vision of God's kingdom coming and God's people being blessed and those who are not part of his kingdom being excluded, and it's never going to be literally fulfilled, that it was a spiritual vision that God oh. gave Ezekiel as to what was to happen with the return from the Babylonian exile as the people turned to God in obedience. That never happened. It remains a future vision given in priestly terms because that's, that's who he was. He was a priest. And, and that's how those who would argue who don't believe in a millennial temple. So to me, okay. I know for many, many years, Mark, I really struggled as a Jewish believer because the rabbis would challenge me with this. The more I looked at it, I thought it's, yeah. it, it's problematic for everyone. Let me drink in the spiritual meaning of it. Let me take in the spiritual sure. reality. Just like when I read the book of Revelation, I don't try to figure out every detail. But, but I, I do absolutely sure. drink in the spiritual power and truths of it and, and, and live with sobriety because of it. So, so, so that's how I would approach it and say, hey, these are question marks that we may not have full answers for on, on this side of things. And as they unfold, they'll make sense. Hey, thank you for the call and nothing OCD uh, about it. All right, let's, uh, let's go to Amy in Chicago. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I wonder if you could tell more about Sukkot or Tabernacles and um, what you have come to see it to mean? Yes. Now that you've become a believer in Messiah? So I, I did not grow up in a religious home, so we didn't celebrate uh, Sukkot in a oh. prominent way. We went to the high holy day services and things, but we didn't put up a sukkah. I didn't grow up with that. Uh, if I did, if it was part of my life, I'd, I'd probably still do it and enjoy it and remember, you know, we're just passing through this world, some of the lessons, etc. But the biggest significance it has to me in an ongoing way as a believer is that it speaks of the final ingathering of the nations. That uh, when you look at the, uh, as, as Numbers lays out the details of this, and lays out the, the sacrifices, 13 bulls on the first day, then 12, then 11. It diminishes each day until you get to a total of 70. And 70 was the, the ancient concept in, in the Bible of the nations of the world, the 70 nations. The rabbis were talking about the 70 nations. And in Zechariah 14, so the Messiah is revealed, Zechariah 12, cleansing for Israel, Zechariah 13. Zechariah 14 the nations now that the survivors of the nations that attack Jerusalem come into Jerusalem to do what worship God when at the Feast of Tabernacles. So this signifies to me the final and gathering of the nations, the great harvest. And as we celebrate it, there's not just the reminder that we're passing through this world, that we don't have a permanent home here, but there is the reminder that there will be the final in gathering of the nations of the world. So that has, uh, a, that's the main significance. When I am able, you know, the times I've been able to celebrate this under the sukkah with other Messianic Jews or uh, sitting with traditional rabbis, there's something very special about it because it's, it's kind of a set-apart time and, and a set-apart place that has significance to it. Uh, but again, it, it, it was never part of my life. If I lived in Israel, it would be part of my life more in terms of the whole nation celebrating a certain way. But I've continued in certain ways, uh, not, not trying to put other things on that weren't part of me when I came to faith, aside from growing in the Lord and his grace. So uh, you may want to check out a book by Mitch and Zahava Glazer, G-L-A-S-E-R on the Fall Feasts of Israel, G-L-A-S-E-R, Mitch and Zahava Glazer. You'll find that really, really edifying. All right. Phone lines are jammed. 
but I've got a guest coming on. So if you're able to call back tomorrow, let's just see. I'm looking at the names here. If you're able to call back tomorrow, please do, and I will put you at the top of our list. Otherwise, it's always next Thursday. God bless. Hey friends, Dr. Michael Brown here. Do you remember when people thought I was crazy when I said it's not too late for America, that God can still do something in our country, that there is going to be a pushback, a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution? And do you remember when people thought that you were crazy because you felt the same way, because you believed what I was saying and already felt it in your heart? Well, friends, that pushback is here. The, the gospel-based moral and cultural revolution we've been talking about for 25 years is unfolding. And we are right in the thick of it. And the line of fire broadcast is divinely positioned for such a time as this. Friends, you would be so gratified and blessed as, as, as I hear, if you could hear what I hear, testimony after testimony as leaders, young people, old people, moms, dads, students, people from all backgrounds come up to me and say, Dr. Brown, you're providing a template for us. You're providing a blueprint for us. You're showing us how to do this, how to have hearts of compassion, backbones of steel. But friends, it's a joint effort. We do this together. And with your support, we can amplify this broadcast around the nation and amplify this voice to shake the nation. Join our support team today. Become a torchbearer with a dollar or more per day. Here's the number to call to sign up. 800-538-5275. That's 800 800- 538-5275 or go to askdrbrown.org askdrbrown.org and become a monthly supporter. Click on donate monthly support. I want to immediately give you two classic books, Compassionate Father or Consuming Fire, Who is the God of the Old Testament and Revolution, which will really show you what it means to be a Jesus follower today. Plus you get free access to our online classes and so much more. Sign up today, askdrbrown.org. This is how we rise up. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on The Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to The Line of Fire on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday as we get into the high holiday season, holy day season on the Jewish calendar, beginning with Yom Truah, the day of the sounding of the trumpet, the blowing of the shofar, and the traditional Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. Hey, shout out to Hector, one of our torchbearers, as your son Daniel is manning the boards today. All right. Uh, I mentioned this uh, amazing book. For those watching, we're just going to just... Uh, put something up when I was in my studio uh, with this book, and uh, just to, to give you an idea, so Dan, you can you can run that B roll. So um, I, I I I was cited in the book, my book on our, our hands are stained with blood, the tragic story of the church and the Jewish people about anti-Semitism in church history. I was cited in the book. That's how I found out about it, and uh I bought the book. I was stunned. It's like 650 pages, and the exact title, hang on, the exact title is, I want to make sure I get it right, a brief, oh yeah, brief, 670 pages brief, a brief and visual history of anti-Semitism by Israel Bitton, B-I-T-T-O-N. I've never seen anything like it. I have no idea how the thing was produced. It's a $50 hardcover book. We're not selling it to our ministry. I've, I've no idea how it was produced. It, it must have been underwritten left and right, every page with visuals and graphics. And then I think there's 75 different sections in it where you, just, you have an app and you just scan, and they'll take you right, okay, here's archival footage, or here's illust- more illustrations, or here's lectures. And just, I, I'm stunned by it. it. It is an incredible compilation. And I reached out to, to, uh, to Mr. Baton and asked if he'd, if he'd come on the air and join us. There may have been an error in scheduling. So tell you what, uh, tell you what, I'm not sure what happened. It appears we had a scheduling error on his end, uh, or one way or another. 
So I want to mention the book, and I'm going to talk to you about anti-Semitism in a moment. Uh, if we, if he is uh, on call up, tied up on another call and getting back to us now, we'll bring him on immediately. But Isaac, stay where you are. I may have time to take some calls after all. So we dropped everybody, but I may have time to take some calls after all. We shall, we shall see. But let me just comment on the uniqueness of anti-Semitism, the uniqueness of Jew hatred, and, and what sets it apart from other hatreds. Now, please hear me. Different people have suffered through history terribly. Different groups. There have been genocides. There have been atrocities. There, there has been enslavement. There, there have been horrible things suffered by different groups of people over the centuries that are terrible, that are horrific, that are barbaric, that are unjustifiable, that show the very, very worst of Jewish nature. The very, very worst of, of excuse me, of human nature, <laughs> Jewish nature, of human nature. The reality is, Jew hatred, hatred of the Jewish people, is unique. It has been pointed out that it is the world's longest hatred. In other words, to single out a particular group and for them to be singled out as a people and hated as such through history is unprecedented. And, and you can go back, you can go back to the, uh, you can go back to, in the Bible, the book of Esther, the hatred of Jews, but even outside of the Bible. About 2,300 years ago in the Greco-Roman world where Jews were hated because they were different. And it's not just the longest hatred, but it's the most widespread hatred. If you think of it, radical Islam hates the Jews, and much of Islam through history has has, has hated the Jews. There's been anti-Semitism in church history. Some of the most vile things ever, ever written have been written by Christian leaders against Jewish people. And, 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 and then you go through, there's atheistic hatred of Jews. You think, why is anti-Semitism so incredibly pervasive? Well, we do have on the line with us Israel Bitton. Israel, thanks so much for joining us today on the Line of Fire. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brown, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, to be talking about this important topic with uh, you and uh, your audience. All right, so, so you are a leader of an organization, Americans Against Anti-Semitism, and you put together this book. Before you came on, I was just singing the praises of, of the book. Honestly, I've never seen anything like it. I, I mean, the, I, I can't imagine the amount of research that went into it, but this must have been heavily underwritten to be able to publish this book. I, I mean, I, I know it goes into putting on a book. So this, yeah. I mean, it has the, this, uh, you know, introduction by the president of Israel, the endorsements behind it. So how did you get this collaborative effort even to happen? Sure. So really this project was born of the creation of this grassroots startup organization itself, Americans Against Anti-Semitism, which was created in 2019 in response to what we you know, the people I work with right away identified as a very serious spike uh, uh, for a lot of different factors that, that obviously go into creating such things. But we noticed the spike. We noticed that other organizations, already legacy orgs, were not really understanding the issue or responding to the issue for a variety of reasons. And therefore, we set out to not duplicate efforts, but say, what can we do to make a dent of a difference in some kind of measurable and meaningful way, not just, you know, do a campaign, and get a lot of attention and, you know, hope that uh, somehow uh, seeing an ad that might be, even if it's compelling, is just going to radically change the picture and, you know, thousands of years of, of this type of uh, phenomena. So uh, one of the things we noticed right away was, and obviously the starting point in almost any corrective for uh, hatred, social hatreds, and, and you know, intercommunal interfaith animosity is, is ignorance. When there's ignorance, it's the perfect breeding ground for uh, both indulging in hatred as well as for Jews who don't know their own history, especially young Jews who are going out in you know, university campuses across the country and are being challenged in ways that they've never been challenged before with lies and just really grotesque uh, conspiracies that are thrown at them and that if they don't know their history, they don't know the truth, uh, the simple truth, the the you know not not based on Jewish sources, but 
as as it's always been out there based on you know the sources themselves whatever wherever it came from um so it was important to address that gap we noticed that anti-semitism although there's a lot written about Jewish history, and there's a lot written about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism as a subject had never been treated uh, curricular. You know, it had never been given and, and translated into a textbook. There's Holocaust, there's uh, Israel, and, you know, Israeli history, Zionism, Jewish history, but there isn't this focus because it's kind of, in the past, it's been looked at as, well, it shows up in different episodes, but it's not really its own thing. And now with anti-Semitism obviously skyrocketing. There's interest in understanding this and th this phenomenon. And, and more importantly, for young people of all backgrounds, uh, young and old, but especially young people who are going to be in these uh, uh, very high-pressure environments where, you know, it's okay to encounter differing opinions, but when it's uh, maliciousness and, and, you know, people coming at you with blood libels and saying, you know, you murdered, you know, Israel, Israel murders uh, Palestinian children. Like it's a, it's a fact of life. Like they, they pick apples off the tree, you know, and uh, that's very stunning for people who are on the receiving end. It, it's not so clear and simple as to how to respond, especially when people are speaking in the name of justice, in the name of humanitarian principles. Uh, every, anyone who has a heart would be like, you know, because you're going to see an image of a, of a child in Gaza whose house was uh, demolished. Uh, anyone, you know, you just, being Jewish makes no difference. You should feel something. But obviously that's not the complete picture, not the full story. So yeah. really the book came about as simply seeing an opportunity, doing something about it. Um, and it was a very big undertaking. It took about two years uh, of nonstop work. Um, and the only reason why it was really feasible is because I d did the research, the writing, and the design, and the layout, oh. uh, the, all, the full range of content, uh, the videos that are popping up on augmented reality, all of that. That's what made it uh, cost-effective, if you will. Otherwise, no other organization would put together the team ordinarily needed or the budget, which would have been three, four, five times the amount that it actually took. So thankfully, people did see the value. It was underwritten by, uh, you know, their names are in the beginning of the book, uh, yep. various, uh, uh, you know, individuals and families who uh, who saw the need and responded. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I, I, I saw it. I, I bought it for myself immediately. And when I got it, I thought, what in the world? I mean, the weight of it, the physical weight of it. <laughs> and, then, and then flipping through, when I brought it in to show my producers uh, uh, day before yesterday, one of them, their, his first comment was, this is like a, a, a school textbook because of yeah. the, the constant illustrations and pictures. The fact you did this in two years is still mind-boggling in terms of the amount of yeah. research work, content on every single page. But this is really a, a 21st century book in that there's an app you download a free app, and then you have 75 or so different places in the book where it says, scan me, and the book actually comes alive. So, so what, what's some of what, and I want to talk about it, the phenomenon of anti-Semitism in a moment, but first the phenomenon of the book. So what, what are some of the things that come alive when you, when you just scan with your phone, and now the, the book is talking to you? Sure. So, you know, there's this thing of augmented reality where, and virtual reality, which in applications such as these and books, especially in education, it can very well veer into gimmicks and, you know, just kind of having it because it's cool. In this scenario, you know, the title of the book is A Brief and Visual History. That is, it would not be the same book if it was only text, not only because it would be boring, but because there is, if one really seeks to understand anti-Semitism, it cannot only be the literature and the pure text because there is a a trove of, and there's this long legacy of the visual depictions and understanding how, uh, you know, Jews, you know, we're called shapeshifters, but we're morphed according to the projections of, you know, each time and place. If they uh -huh. needed, if it needed to be about finance, it would be about finance. If it needed to be about race, it was about race and being a, a vermin class, whatever it might have been. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's obviously that's something that uh, has evolved. Uh, over time, but uh, what we're seeing with the AR in this case is that there's a need also, the other side is that some of these uh, propositions that anti-Semites have made over the generations is, especially where there's uh, video evidence in the last hundred years, is mind boggling and, and in some cases like almost unbelievable. So there's an aspect of see it for yourself, hear it for yeah. yourself, be yeah. 
have your mind boggled. Like, for example, I mean, when I first discovered it, it still boggles my mind that Hitler actually got up. Uh, okay, wait, hey, hey, hang, hang on right hang on right there, sir. sir. We'll come back on the other side of, of the break and, and hear more, get into this very illustration. And so I don't forget the Shana Tova, Israel. Thank you very much. Nopalea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. I really enjoy being physical. It's something I've just always loved, but I've definitely had times where it's really crippled me up. Being a horse trainer can be pretty physically demanding with all the duties that I have, not just riding horses for a living, saddling horses, caring for the horses. I feel like no playa just took the edge off. And then it's it's continued to keep me from getting sore. No playa, it's been a huge blessing. Now there's a solution by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. Nopalea, made from the superfruit of the Nepal cactus, containing a unique group of bioflavonoids clinically shown to reduce chronic inflammation. In a random double-blind placebo-controlled study, it showed a reduction of elevated at-risk C-reactive protein levels, resulting in an improvement in range of motion in the back, neck, and joints and an overall improvement in the quality of life. It's fun to be on the golf course again. I'm able to swing the club freely. Hopefully I'm hitting better golf shots. No play has allowed me to get back on the golf course, enjoy the game that I love, and maybe even give me that little edge to beat my friends at the game. No Palea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. To place your order, call 800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. As a new customer introductory offer, use promo code BROWN25 for a 25% discount on your purchase of Nopalea. And 100% of your first order will go to the support of Line of Fire. Go to Trivita.com or call 800-771-5584. Again, 800-771-5584. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Baton, his extraordinary new book, I, I, I can't urge you strongly enough to get it. We're not selling these. I've got no connection to the publisher. I'm just saying this as someone that's combated anti-Semitism for many, many years. It's, it's, it's a must. And for the whole family, different ages, uh, you, you dig into this. Scholars want to research, just find tons of stuff in one place. And then again, the visual elements. It's, it really is an extraordinary book. A brief and visual History of anti-Semitism. It's it's worth five or ten times what you pay for it because of the production values there, and then everything that will come alive in the book for you. Uh, and Israel, as you know, I mentioned it to you early on in my own faith journey. The local rabbi gave me a book on anti-Semitism in church history, and as I've talked to professors at seminaries over the years, church historians, and I said, "When do you teach on this in your classes?" Or where, when do you talk about the sermons of Chrysostom and God hates the Jews? Or when do you talk about Luther's anti-Semitic writings? And they've looked at me shamefully and said, we don't. And it reminds me of what Edward Flannery said, the Catholic scholar, that the pages of history Jews have memorized, uh, Christians have torn out of their history books. So we can never be reminded too much. But right before the break, you were giving one of the illustrations, which is impossible to, to believe this without seeing it about Hitler. So please, back to you. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for that, um, you know, vote of confidence and uh, support in, you know, the book and what you saw. And uh, it's um, greatly appreciated. I don't either stand to gain from it, despite what I, I put. I, I did it because I believed in it. And, uh, you know, it'll get as far as it gets. And, you know, hopefully it makes that impact. Um, in terms of what I was saying earlier, I'll just finish on that very quickly. Is is just, you know, the visual and the 
aspect is really to uh, to illustrate the full scale, the, the full dimension of this issue, because to uh, discount the visual element, to discount the fact that the most outlandish things have been said. Um, it's also important, and there's a reason why, you know, it's a history. The point is for people to understand that there is absolutely nothing in the anti-Semites and anti-Semitism canon that has not already been said by whoever, you know, originated it 2,500 years ago about money, about gold, about, uh, you know, disease, about uh, taking over, plotting, whatever it might be, there's no originality. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me personally, having experienced anti-Semitism growing up and, you know, kind of hits you out of left field, that was very important to help me understand that, in a sense, don't take it personally. It's got nothing to do with me. I didn't do anything. Uh, those people, you know, individuals who engage in such activity, obviously have some kind of problem, and they're projecting that and taking it out on, you know, someone who just happens to be uh, fitting a, a, a certain scapegoat uh, description. So that's that's obviously uh, uh, rather unfortunate. But, um, yeah, that, that is just to complete that point that, you know, it, it is not, in fact, a gimmick, and it is important to look and to see and to hear uh, and to for, w with one's own eyes and one's own ears. You know, it, there, there's a point of having that impression, especially on uh, younger people who uh, are, you know, not being exposed to this stuff or, or being exposed to things in 15-second bits and, and whatnot. Yeah. So what would be an example, then, of something that, that Hitler said or did that's like, no, that never happens? Like, okay, <laughs> let's look. Here, here, well, look with your own eyes. Yeah, the, the, it's not almost that it never happened. It's just it would astound anyone that when we talk about it after the fact that six million Jews were killed, you know, millions of, of people from every nationality, Poles, Russians, Germans themselves, uh, you know, uh, uh, civilians, uh, you know, children, women were also killed. Um, and, and that scale of deaths would be unimaginable. Yet we look at 1939 and there's video of Hitler proclaiming at the Reichstag that, you know, if uh, there's a world war looming and if it if it starts, uh, it, the world should know that it's the Jews who are going to be destroyed and pay the price. So, it's like, wow, wait, what? He actually got on the stage and mm. said he was going to do what he did. And still the world didn't believe it for six years as he was perpetuating this, this brutal genocide. That's astounding. That's a lesson in, in of itself. So and that's just one little video that, you know, makes the page come alive. Basically, you'll see the image, and then it converts. You scan, you hold the phone over the page, and that just turns into the video, actual archival video of, you know, that moment, 15, 20, 30 seconds, whatever it might be. And it's the same thing with other seminal moments. The other thing is there are 3D models of different uh, uh, landmarks, such as the uh, Second Temple, such as the Kaaba in, in Mecca, um, and uh, others where, you know, the user can kind of manipulate it, turn it around, basically explore it uh, as a 3D model. Uh, so there are items like that as well that make it a little more interactive and immersive than simply, you know, text on a page. And the whole point of it, as I write in the book, is not to create debaters and let's engage and just arm people to go out there with facts and, you know, and debate. The whole point was that it should let the people, you know, any good intention person know that they don't need to debate their, their life is, you know, Israel, the fact that it's like seeking legitimacy for its existence, that that's a problem. You know, nobody as a matter of, of existential fact has to prove their right to exist. The fact that you exist, you have a right to exist. It's that simple. You know, that's the, that's the rule of nature. Uh, and that's why it's a crime to kill somebody because who... And, and, and take that existence from someone else. And yet, this is a double standard that has long been applied to Jews and now to the state of Israel. Yeah, again, friends, the book, A Brief and Visual History of Anti-Semitism, Israel B. Bitton, B-I-T-T-O-N. So you've immersed yourself in this. You experienced this growing up. You've immersed yourself in the subject. You've looked at the academic literature. You also have some uh, philosophical studies in your background. We've just got a couple of minutes, but if someone said to you, why? Why, why anti-Semitism? Because the, you can't connect all the disparate threads through history and different, you know, and the accusations and everything. You said they repeat themselves, but you, when you try to connect all the dots, it becomes very difficult. Be, you know, when Jews are 
they're influential, they're hated. When they're at the bottom of society, they're hated. When they're religious, they're hated. When they're secular, they're hated. Right. So right. And if someone says, why anti-Semitism, what's your ultimate answer? So I would say it comes down to really three things. Um, it's storytelling, the phenomenon of hatred as a human, uh, in the human condition, and then the fact that Judaism is the only religion in the history of the world in the evolution of religions to give birth to outgrowth religions. And that in of itself, unfortunately, has never really been examined, appreciated, mm. uh, really looked at and say, how do we go back to that source and correct where that, you know, because, well, if you're coming as an outgrowth and there's uh, a a animosity, there's, uh, and for reasons, because at first, before Christianity became, uh, you know, the, the, uh, a religion of the of the Roman Empire. They were actually persecuted by the the Roman Empire for for centuries. Right. Um, and and it was you know understandable acrimony between this group that that was coming from you know uh, uh, a Jewish core, and then there was confusion in, in in beliefs on both sides. Both sides would then castigate and say, hey, you know, don't go next to the Christians. They would tell Jews. They would tell Jew Christians, don't go next to the Jews. Vice versa. From there, the fact is that. It's Judaism that gave birth to Christianity, uh, gave birth to Islam, that, that is now uh, uh, faith for nearly 4 billion people or more in, in the world today. So that's a very different trajectory than almost any other group and mm. the world's interest in them. Now, what preceded that moment of getting off on the wrong foot is, as the, you know, there was a divergence between Christianity and Judaism is the idea that, well, where does hate come from? What, what is hatred? We look at if you look at the Bible, the, the Torah, the Old Testament, the the first instance of this type of hatred and what it leads to is Cain and Abel. And and why is Cain killed his brother? Because he's jealous. And what is jealousy? It's a story. That means that hatred, that hate that leads someone to do something, something is taking someone's life is based on a story. Now, in most cases, that story is corrupted. Of course, if somebody does a horrible thing to, to another person, we can understand why they may hate that individual. It would still not be it would still not be logical to expand that hatred to that you know every association that that person may have. So what we have with Judaism, what we have with this legacy of anti-Semitism, is the fact that well, going back a second, what are what makes humans really different than all other animals is that we're storytellers who can actually record media and pass that on transgenerationally in ways that say, whales, which can do a lot transgenerationally, transgener still cannot. They can't record a, a, a physical media picture of, uh, you know, their great ancestor and pass that information down in a direct way. But when it comes to humanity and society, we can't. We can make up ancient books that say horrible things about Jews that will survive over the generations, that will mm. proliferate, that will uh, take on new words, new meanings, new context, etc. But now we have this storytelling problem because what, behind any hatred, we say anti-Semitism, and some will say, no, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Zionist. No, I, I don't hate Jews. I just don't like that they control the world. I don't like <laughs> hate Jews. I just, all of that type of stuff at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, literally, it, it's, it's constant, it's repeated. There's nothing uh, uh, novel in that. But yeah. the point being that these are corrupted stories. The idea is that as a society, collectively, we're all responsible and the corruption is the corruption of the golden rule. Whereas nobody would accept the treatment, whether it's to Jews, whether it's to a black person or to a Christian, if you're a Christian being persecuted throughout the world. There, there's one standard, either persecution uh, of people for their identity or their beliefs or their physical characteristics, whatever it might be, is either society writ large is against it and they're adamant and they're consistent or not yeah hey listen i've got to jump in we are we're actually out of time already but thank you sir for coming on the air and thank you for putting this this book together i really urge everybody that can do it especially as we come into the high holy days get this book share it let truth disseminate and push back against the darkness a brief and visual history of anti-Semitism. All right, great job.